Hi, I'm Sebeniako. The title of this presentation is SEPIC Converter Made Simple and How Did It Evolve? Before starting with the analysis of the converter, let me say a few words about an inductor because uh, the understanding of the inductor is really of prime importance in analyzing the uh, separate circuit and in fact many other uh, converters. Now if we have an inductor shown here which is switched between two voltages V1 and V2 in kind of a continuous way then what will happen is that we are imposing the voltage V1 on L when one switch is closed this is a switch shown here the MOSFET transistor and then when S2 is conducting we impose the other voltage notice that I've put here this is a positive voltage this is a negative now the state space equation of a inductor says that the voltage is equal to L the IDT that is the rate of change or which is very important that the average voltage is equal to L times the average rate of change. So as I impose the voltages of V1 here and V2, we have the IDT that is the rate of change and the rate of change is V1 over L. That is the IDT will be V1 over L because V1 is the voltage imposed on the inductor uh, actually uh, at that time. Now, when the inductor is connected to V2, we have a minus sign because the voltage is negative and we have a downslope of this magnitude. If the inductor is sort of coming to the same point that if we are at a stable stage, state and we are not sort of going up or down, this means that the average rate of change is zero. This means that the average voltage on the inductor must be zero in steady state. This would imply that if this is the voltage here on the inductor, this is during V1, this is during V2, that this area here must be equal to this. Once we understand it, it will be really simple to analyze the circuit. Now, before I start with the SEPIC, which is shown here, there are some assumptions that we are uh, making when doing the analysis uh, and that would be that the ripple is low. Now we have output capacitor here. We have also a capacitor, a coupling capacitor here I'll talk about in a minute. Both of which are relatively large capacitors and we are assuming that the ripple on them, that is when you look at the voltage, this ripple is uh, rather small. Okay, another assumption is that the uh, diode has a zero voltage. This is this diode here, a zero voltage. This is not exactly correct because um, in um, low voltage applications, uh, you certainly would like to take into account the voltage drop on the diode. It can be uh, accounted for easily. I'm not doing it here. I'll just mention where it should be included. Another assumption is that the resistances are low, that is, uh, you have an inductor here, you have an inductor here, and of course you have this uh, MOSFET, all have uh, parasitic resistances, and we are assuming that they are just small enough to be neglected. And finally, we are assuming that we are working in the CCM mode, that is continuous conduction mode, which implies that if you look at the inductor current, you'll see something like that. That is, there is a continuous current. It never crosses the zero. That is, you, you're not, you don't see pictures, um, say, like this. This will be a DCM, this is a discontinuous conduction mode. We are working here, or we are analyzing the circuit for the continuous conduction mode. Okay, now the SEPIC circuit consists of a input source, the power source, input inductor, this coupling capacitor, and a diode, the output section with a filter capacitor, and a load. This RL represents the load, could be any device, a smartphone, or anything else. Now, there's an inductor here. 
connected between this point and ground. A key point to start the analysis is the question, what is the voltage, the steady state voltage on the capacitor on this? We are assuming that the operation is with a given so duty cycle, that is the switch is turned on and then off and then turned on and then off. And uh, we also define the on time, this is the on time over the period, this is the period, this ratio is the on, or many times we just call it the, and then the rest of the time that is T off over T is the off. Now let's get back to the capacitor voltage. Let's start with this point here, which I'll call Vy. If I look at the other side of the inductor here, this point is ground. The voltage is zero. This means that if the average voltage on L2 is zero, as we have just said, the average voltage of Vy must be zero. That is, Vy average must be zero. Now let's move to the other point, Vx. Again, if I look at this L1, V in is connected to one side. I'm looking at the other side for the average voltage to be zero. Vx must be V in. So very quickly we have found that the capacitor at the steady state will have a voltage on it which is V in, and the polarity will be plus here and minus here. This can be then used to go on and analyzing the circuit. So let's have a look now at the point Vx again, and now time-wise to see how the voltage is changing as a function of time. Now we know the average of this point, of this uh, voltage here is V in, but it is not a DC voltage, it's changing. When the transistor is on, this point here is in effect shorted to ground. Here it is, shorted to ground. And then as the transistor is non-conducting, what we see here is the voltage on the capacitor, the voltage on the diode, and V out. So the total voltage is V in plus diode voltage plus V out. At this point, I'm neglecting the diode voltage. If the output voltage is low, then one has to take it into account and you can actually add it in. In this expression, it is being neglected. So this would be the picture of Vx. We see ground and we see jumping to a value of V in plus V out. So now let's have a look at the inductor L1. When the transistor is conducting, Vx is zero and V in is imposed on L1. Here it is. VL1, voltage of L1 is V in. Now when the transistor is non-conducting, we have on one side V in and on the other side, here it is, we have V in, this is the voltage of the capacitor, plus V out, neglecting the diode. So V in minus V in plus V out is minus V out, minus V out. Here it is. Okay. So the voltage imposed the VL1 is positive in, negative V out. And of course, the current of the inductor will be like a triangular triangle. It will go up with the slope of V in over L1, and then go down with the slope of V out over VL1. So this will be the uh, voltage imposing on the diode, and of course, this area must be equal to this area at steady state. Knowing that this area is indeed equal to this area at steady state, we can now do a simple calculation stating that the areas are equal, 
Now we can calculate this area as this voltage, which is V in times the time, which is T on. So this is this area here. And then this area here will be V out over T off. Divided by T, we get V in times D on is V out over D off, which ends up with this expression for the voltage gain. That's it. So we understand that the SEPI converter has a voltage gain which is equal to D on over D off, which is very nice because it implies that the gain can be higher or lower than one. For if D on is equal to D off, and this will be 0.5 and 0.5, the gain will be one. If D on is say 0.7 and D off is 0.3, it will be larger than one. And if D on will be 0.3 and D off 0.7, then it will be lower than 1. So this uh, converter has the very important feature of being able to, to be up and down converter. So you can get a voltage which is lower or higher than the input. Let's have a look at L2. Here is again the swi switcher here, the timing of the uh, switch. And here is the voltage on the L2. When the switch is, say, off, we have current flowing this way. Which is non this switch is non-conducting. And therefore, this point is actually clamped to the output. So this will be V out. When the switch is on, this point is ground. And since this is charged to... V in minus V in will be imposed on the inductor. So it will be this thing here. So again, we have two areas here, A1 and this is A1 here, A1 and A2. And we can do the same calculation that the area A1 is V in D on. The other area is V out to the off. And of course, we get the same expression. So you can see that you can get the again the voltage gain from looking at any one of the uh, inductors. Now, what about the average currents? That is, we understand that the inductor current goes up and down, etc. But what will be the average value of it? It's very important for the design of the inductor to know the average voltage. In fact, the average and the peak voltage. If you look at the circuit, you see here a capacitor. Through a capacitor, there is no DC current flowing either way. Because if there be a DC current, the voltage on the capacitor will either stop, uh, continue building up or going down. So the average current through a capacitor is zero. This would mean that the DC voltage of the output is flowing through the inductor L2. No other way. So you can say that the average current of L2 is the output current, which is V out over RL. What about the average current here? Well, assuming that the losses are low, and this is our analysis is based on that, the power coming from the input, which is the average current times V in, is the power that is delivered to the output, which is I out, V out. So therefore, you can calculate the current of the uh, coming in, that is the inductor current, because this is the inductor current, as I out times D, which makes sense. Uh, if D is high, this means that you have a higher voltage at the output, then you need a higher current at the input uh, to get uh, the correct power. So let's summarize what are the characteristics of the uh, SEPIC converter. First of all, it's up-down. That's very good. So you can get a voltage which is higher or lower. This is very good in cases when, for example, you have a battery of, say, 6 volts, just for the sake of uh, example, and then you have a load that requires a stable 6 volt. And here is the converter that has to supply it. As you charge the battery, 
the voltage will go up. If I get too close to 7 volts. And as it delivers charge to the load, it'll go down maybe to uh, 5 volts. So you need a converter that will be capable of supplying the 6 volt while the input could be higher or lower than that. So this is why an up-down converter is really, really very convenient in many, many applications. It's non-inverting. Non-inverting means that the polarity of the output is the same as the input. This is also very good because in many applications, if you have a battery or a source, you like the output to be of the same polarity. We have the back boost converter, which looks something like that. Now this back boost converter also has the capability of up-down, but the output is negative. Here is positive, here is negative. This is not very useful in many applications. So this is also a very good feature. There is a series capacitor here, this capacitor here. This has a plus and a minus. The plus is that it has a sort of isolation between the input and output. And for example, if you have a short at the output, and if you then detect it and you sort of block the operation of the switch, nothing will happen because this capacitor uh, is preventing DC current from flowing from here to here. So this is very nice. On the other hand, an extra capacitor, which is a big capacitor, is uh, expensive. And um, also, uh, you, have, you are passing through it all the current, and consequently, it's a capacitor that can carry heavy current, which makes it uh, more complex. So a series capacitor is really a plus and a, a minus in the circuit. Now, there are two inductors. Uh, this is not, of course, desirable. It's better to have one. But that's the way the circuit works. And finally, the output is pulsating. That is, you get current like this. And um, this means that the ripple will be higher, and this means that you need a larger uh, filter capacitor, which is not a very good feature. Uh, but again, that's the nature of the beast here. Let me say a few words about the evolution of this SEPI converter, which is, I think, kind of interesting. The first time the converter is described in the literature that is in a publication is in this paper by Massey and Snyder from Bell Laboratories. It was published in 1977 in PESC conference. This is Power Electronic Specialty Conference. This conference doesn't exist anymore under this name. It's been combined with another conference. And uh, this is the first time we understand what is SAPIC, a strange name. Well, it stands for Single-Ended Primary Inductance Converter. That's SAPIC. Now, the name comes from this circuit, which Massey and Snyder worked on. This is the circuit they worked on. And here's the inductor. There is a transformer here, and the inductor is on the primary side. And uh, also, this is the primary inductance of the circuit. So hence, the name single-ended primary inductance converter. The paper described this circuit here, which is a... Uh, transformer isolated version, which has many merits because there is galvanic isolation between input and output, so it's uh, really suitable for power line application. But they did not work on the non-isolated version that we talked about. Now, they are showing, however, that if you reflect the secondary to the primary, that you look into here and see what you see, this is the circuit that you see, and they use it for the analysis. This circuit now includes some parasitic element. This is the leakage inductance, which is irrelevant to the non-isolated version. This is also a 
relative to capacitance. So you can see that this circuit is very similar, except that the capacitor is here. You can actually move it here. The circuit would be the same, and you'll get the uh, common ground between input and output as we would like to have. So this is actually the static circuit. But as I have said, this is not how they actually use it. They just use the circuit to explain the operation of this uh, isolated or transformer isolated version. Now, they are also referring to a previous circuit that is described in this patent, and the patent is by Clark, also from Bell Laboratories. And if you look at the circuit, well, there are some elements that are similar. There's an inductor here, there's a clamping diode, but it really takes a inventive step to uh, get from this point to the SEPIC. The first time SEPIC was actually described in the literature is indeed in this paper, but it's not clear that they have actually invented it. It probably was invented at Bell Laboratories, and the rumor says that it has been developed as part of the uh, power supply for one of the first PCs for IBM. Well, this is a uh, common notion uh, by many uh, researchers in the field, but I have not found any uh, real reference uh, for that. And finally, uh, the actually presentation of the septic converter in the non-isolated version that we talked about, and this is this circuit, was, to my knowledge, first described by Professor Kazimierczuk and Joswick from Wright State University in this paper from 1989, quite a bit after uh, the first publication. And uh, they are describing it as a well-known circuit that everybody knows about, and they are showing this circuit as well as the uh, isolated or transformer isolated version, uh, so that this is where I found the uh, actually non-isolated version uh, as shown as it is. So this brings me to the end of this presentation. I hope you enjoyed the presentation and uh, it'll be perhaps useful to you. Thank you very much for your attention.